pitch this. Zombie apocalypse, walking dead. I'm out there. Zombies come charging towards me. Head down. Protecting. Flick. 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 In the face. It's like a backhand to the face. Zombie. Slap. Zombie. Slap. Laughing. They're like, oh wow. We can still get through that. Oh, that's what you think. I duck under the arm. Dip to the side. Hat off. Yeet. I'm a cowboy. Grab the zombie by the neck. Pull him close towards me. Zombie's right there. I decide, actually, you know what? We're not close. I don't want to cuddle. Maybe go away, zombie. Please don't eat me. Welcome to Thursday, welcome back to another video. Uh, true story, I've actually already filmed this video. We had a bit of an audio file issue and it's corrupted, which is bloody annoying. So here we are, we'll film it again. And hopefully it's as good as the first one. I was actually really happy with the first one, but we're back in front of the screens, in front of the computer, doing, that's not the computer, the computer, doing the bits and bobs that need to be done, which is obviously a video. And today we're gonna speak about Athlean X and his 12 must do exercises that apparently everybody must do. So I'm very curious as you know I am. Thank you so much for all of the support on the recent video. I feel very privileged to be in a position where people are constantly enough to share their experiences with me, but also are kind enough to support me when I share mine. Again, I can't thank you enough. I'm sorry that I'm being quite slow with replying to comments, because as you know, I do like to read and reply to all of my comments while I can at least. Before we crack on with the video, few things must occur as you know. 1100 likes in the first 24 hours is the goal. So if you like the video, then let me know by liking the video and like I said if we hit that goal that'll be bloody splendid because you smashed the last one you smashed the last two actually that that's all right the Natasha one was close so, so you were getting you're gonna be sweating for a bit in addition to that if you haven't already please do consider clicking the red button down below and subscribing to the channel and the bell next to it so you get notified when I upload every week twice a week and if you have a question you want me to answer at the end of the next video drop it down below for comment question of the week and I shall do so well, let's play the game of will this hat fit on my big head you can't actually see the full hat because it's rather large let's look at Athlean X and what he's doing on the line today I'm going to talk about the 12 exercises that everyone should be including in their programs. And before anybody jumps out and says, well, wait a second, not everybody should be doing every exercise. Guys, as a physical therapist, I understand that sometimes physical limitations actually preclude you from doing an exercise. But I'm talking about if you are physically capable of doing the exercises in this list, then we all should be doing them and including them in our programs if we want to see the best benefits. I personally don't believe that there is any exercise that anybody needs to do. And by need, I literally mean like must do. Because it's very much dependent on goals and whatnot. But I don't think there's ever a need to do movement. And it starts right here with a squat. So it figures we'd start with the king of all lower body exercises, the squat. And we know that this exercise is incredibly powerful for hitting the quads and the glutes and the adductors and even the hamstrings. However, it's also one of the most fundamental movement patterns that we all need to sort of learn how to get stronger at. The squat is certainly a great movement. I feel like it's certainly a movement that a lot of people could definitely benefit from learning because there is quite a carryover from the squat to other movements. Like if you could squat well, you could probably leg press well, you could probably do other movements well. But if you can squat already and you're kind of like more intermediate advanced, again, depending your goals do you need to squat there are a few things to consider so let's say your goals are looking at optimizing hypertrophy and you want to grow the quads for example arguably one might say that machines could be better for optimizing hypertrophy because you are able to take the muscles closer to failure if not to failure more safely it's squat or hack squat for the hypertrophy i'd probably lean towards the the hack squat because if, if you fail a hack squat you kind of just flop off you know just roll over and flop off. You fail a back squat. There are a few more considerations when it comes to safety involved. One of the ways of gauging how effective a movement is for hypertrophy is how safely you can take it to failure and how close to failure you can actually take it and the squat might be a bit limiting for that. He also does go on to speak about like variations like the split squat, the goblet squat, etc. Variations are fantastic. I do align with that. I think having a squat variation in your program is certainly important. Personally, my least favorite of the bunch is probably going to be the goblet squat because that's going to be the hardest one, in my opinion, to take close to failure. Other areas may give out before your legs do. And there's no better exercise for hitting the posterior chain than the deadlift. The deadlift is gonna train the all important hinge pattern, which is one that you're gonna to need to master if you not only wanna excel at the lift, but actually in everyday life. I'm kind of pondering the thought of, for posterior chain, is a deadlift better like a regular deadlift, like a conventional deadlift, or is an RDL better? I'm looking at risk to reward. Is there greater risk involved with deadlifting versus RDLs? But is the reward much greater? That's a thought. I'm, I'm pondering that one. I really have been for a while, actually. Personally, for glute and hamstrings, I do prefer the RDL. But when looking at like the lower back, ability to shift more weight, arguably the deadlift could be better. 
It's a tricky one. I do think that having like a hip hinge exercise is certainly a big yes. And his form is a bit meh. The hinge is not simply... There was a bit of a jerk at the start there. His head position is also a bit wild. I mean, like Jeff, as a physical therapist, you you know that a neutral spine runs from the tailbone all the way to the, the neck and the head. So this head needs to be down for the spine to be considered really neutral. But then flip it around. Do you need a neutral spine? That's a big argument people kind of present. Arguably, if your back remains in the same position throughout the movement and that angle is consistent, no from the research I've read, it's more the changing of angles that can promote issues. We've got the squats and the deadlifts already, so now it's time for the bench press. And we know that the bench press is one of the best ways to build the chest, period. Is it one of the best ways to build the chest? Let's ponder that, shall we? So personally, I think the bench press is actually overrated for pec development, obviously pec being the chest. And this is primarily due to the kind of limited ability to bring the humerus across the body. So one of the functions of the pec is to obviously bring the humerus being the upper arm across the body. When you're pressing on a bench press with a barbell, you're really taking it across to the, the mid like center point of the body. So arguably, although the bench press is a solid movement, one might consider a dumbbell press or like a converging chest press, something that allows the humerus to go from here across the body to be potentially more effective at developing the pecs. And you also gotta consider like the safety thing I mentioned in the squat. It's a bit easier and safer taking like a dumbbell press or like a converging chest press to failure than it is a bench press, which again is gonna be quite important when looking at hypertrophy. But flip around, if you're a powerlifter, yes, you do need a bench press. And there are a lot of big benches out there that actually have a very underdeveloped chest. You're not gonna find an athlete next program that doesn't include this next exercise and it's the pull up. And the reason why the pull-up appears in every Athlinex program is not because I think it's the best bodyweight back exercise there is, it's because I think it's one of the best back exercises that there is. Pull-up is obviously fantastic. I think learning to move your body weight and use your body weight is a great time, and it's definitely a skill, and it's also bloody hard to do. But let's say you're looking at like the lats, for example. I think the pull-up could be overrated for lat development. We're gonna look at the upper arm in relation to the torso here. The upper arm is relatively far away from, from the body here, because ultimately when you're looking at like optimizing lat development, you want your upper arm to be as close to the torso as possible throughout. For example, when you're doing a pull-up, it's quite far away. Whereas if you're doing like a neutral grip pull-up, for example, or like an underhand grip pull-up, the upper arm is far closer to the, the torso throughout the entire movement. The face pull is one of my favorite exercises, once again for the posterior chain, but this time for the upper body. Oh uh, yeah, again, I actually buy this. I love the face pull. I think it's a fantastic movement, especially when you look at shoulder health. And one of the big things I love about the face pull is the fact that it incorporates external rotation. And that's kind of what he's doing here. A lot of people, when they go too heavy, they turn into like a high neck row. That kind of defeats the purpose. That is very much just an upper back dominant row. What we want is the external rotation here. As if you're posing and tense your back in, in the mirror. So this is a bloody good movement. And I know Jeff does, does tickle a good face pull. And speaking of the rotator cuff, let's keep exercise number six here tied into the last one and keep that corrective exercise focus going. Something as simple as banded external rotation here is gonna get the job done. Do you need to include this movement if you're doing enough face pulls? It's a tricky one. I feel like if you are going to include a movement like this, I wouldn't treat it as like a main lift, as like a main exercise. Maybe treat it as like a warm up. And for me, this is a no brainer. It's got to be the lunge, or at least some variation of the lunge. Now, I talked about my love for the reverse lunge because of its kindness to people that have anterior knee issues. Blow splendid for the glutes, I and mean, we do we do like building the glutes despite how some small mind may be. The lunge is kind of comparable to the split squat regarding like muscles being used and whatnot. I think they're both fantastic movements. I would certainly include a variation of at least one of them. Number eight here was not meant to push anybody's buttons or ruffle any feathers. It's just simply to put an exercise in here that belongs on the list and it's the push up. You see, people might have a problem with this being on the list, especially coming from me. Body weight movement, fantastic. A good one of that. So it's very much dependent on like what equipment you have access to and what your goals are. But when you're looking at like hypertrophy, is it a bit limiting? How well can you progressively overload it? Big things to consider. I find like push-ups put my wrist in quite a compromised position because you're obviously you're basically like this against the floor and that kind of prevents you from being able to really stack the joint, i.e. the wrist and elbow being in one line. So whenever I do do push-ups, I often actually do them on my knuckles. And I know what you're thinking. Wow, Harry, you're hard, you're scary, you're intimidating, doing them on your knuckles. You would be absolutely wrong. I intimidate nobody. It's a bit nicer on my wrist, and it's also a bit more tricep dominant because I can tuck my elbows in a bit more, and I am quite a tricep dominant person. I'm quite a tricep dominant presser, actually. And when we're talking about pressing exercises, we've hit our horizontal press option, but what about our vertical plane? Because that's important too. And for me, there's no other option than the overhead press. 
Now I get it, the overhead press can not only be one of the most effective strength building exercises in the vertical plane, but it could also introduce some pain into a shoulder that's actually already having a hard time. Arguably, the overhead press can be deemed like what one can maybe consider functional because you're bringing a lot of the core and it's a standing movement in which you're potentially more likely to exert force from a standing position throughout your daily life. Does it have a massive carryover to bench press? I don't necessarily think so. I think if you have a big overhead press, it doesn't necessarily mean your bench press is gonna be bigger than somebody with a maybe not so impressive overhead press. And one could argue, could standing movements limit how much weight you use because of the consideration of so many other factors like what your core is doing, what other areas of the body are doing, etc. So when like looking at optimizing hypertrophy, I would probably lean more towards like a seated movement because like I said, you can push a lot of weight and you're also removing certain factors and variables that could hinder your ability to, to push that weight. I feel like with the overhead press standing, you're more likely to hit technical failure before muscular failure. And when a lot of people do overhead press and they get start reaching failure, they start shooting back and essentially turn themselves into a question mark. Don't do that, no question mark. When in doubt, don't question mark out. That puts you in a very compromised position. How close to failure can you take it safely? Are technical failures gonna occur before muscular, et cetera, et cetera. Which brings us to exercise number 10, which is now the dedicated arm exercise portion. I'm going right for the triceps now, the bigger part of our arm, and we're talking about the lion tricep extension. And the thing that I love about this exercise is it puts that all important long head, the meatiest portion of our triceps, basically two thirds of the two thirds of the size of our arm on a great amount of stretch on every single repetition. Try meaning three, set meaning head. So you've got the short head, which is here, also known as like the lateral head, which is this kind of one. You can't really see because I'm wearing a jumper. And you've got the long head, which is the, the meaty one under here. And you've got the medial head, which is kind of lingering there. Overhead movements like a lying extension are gonna be more long head dominant. And all I will say is this, is if you start getting tickly elbow pain, you may find that you're actually kind of dropping straight down. Don't be afraid to kind of pull your shoulders back a bit and put your arm at more of an angle before then initiate the movement because that can take a bit of the pressure off the elbow. And that's actually what helped me when I was getting elbow pain when doing skull crusher variations or like things like this. And it's obviously a good time because you can go heavy on it. Don't be afraid to throw in cable work as well. So when you're looking to round out that arm development and I mean literally round it out, now we gotta talk about bicep exercises. For me, the barbell curl is gonna be my choice. Now I like the exercise with a barbell because I can load the exercise up a little bit heavier than usual and I get the benefits of the cheat rep option where I can load up the weight and take advantage of that heavy eccentric overload. Do, arguably, again, depending on goals, do you need to bicep work if you're doing enough pulling work? Maybe not, but obviously if you want bigger arms, then yes, you probably do need to target your biceps a bit more. The standard barbell curl, I don't like. It puts your wrists in a very disadvantaged position. I can't actually get my wrists to the position a barbell would want me in. I much prefer an easy curl bar like Jeff is doing here because it's more of a natural position for the wrists. Is it the movement I would choose? I think obviously when you're looking at optimizing bicep development, as I've spoken about before, you want kind of three real movements in there. A movement in which the shoulder is in front of the body like a spider curl or a preach curl. A movement in which the shoulder is behind the body like a cable curl with the machine behind you or an incline dumbbell curl. And a movement in which the, the hands are neutral like a, a hammer curl, which is obviously more brachialis dominant. If I could only choose one bicep movement to do, it would likely be more of a long head dominant movement like either the incline dumbbell curl or a cable curl. That to us, that is just actually based on preference. And last but certainly not least, when it comes to the exercise selections, guys, you're gonna have to have some variation of a barbell row in your plan. The barbell row is gonna take us to the promised land where we're looking to address our horizontal pulling needs. I do think horizontal rowing is bloody important and arguably, would it be considered more important than vertical pulling, potentially, although I think a good program includes both of them. But for hypertrophy, I don't know if the barbell row is my favorite. I think when looking at like kind of overall fitness and resistance training for function and fitness, and perhaps a barbell row is, is more necessary there. But when looking at like optimizing lat development, for example, I'd probably consider like a dumbbell row or a plate loaded row of some kind. But like I said, it really just depends on goals and what you're trying to do. I think with the barbell row, it's a bit more versatile potentially regarding targeting different areas of the back. So obviously you can alter your hand positioning, which then in turn alters your your upper arm positioning to then place greater emphasis on different areas of the back, which is obviously a good time. I think with all that being said, these are what I consider to be like basic movements. And I think it's very important to learn the basics, especially if you are a beginner. So arguably for beginners, I do think including most of these movements is very important in your programming. And again, it very much depends on goals. Whereas if you're more intermediate to advanced and you can already do these movement patterns effectively and safely, maybe, maybe it's less important. I think there are potentially better alternatives to prioritize for the hundredth time 
time, depending on goals. Like if we're looking at optimizing hypertrophy, I think I would probably substitute a fair few movements for better alternatives. Kind of question, I don't know why he's promoting this as everybody must do these movements. They need, they need to be done. When you say somebody must do a movement, I think it can be quite intimidating and kind of a bit of a deterrent for many. So sure, learning how to do these movement patterns is certainly extremely important. But I don't like ever forcing anybody to believe that they need to do something or they must do something. It's a good list, really good movements for the most part. Maybe a few movements I would make some match and substitute, but it very much is like I said, dependent on goals, which is the, the big thing you have heard many times today, which you want to get a count of how many times I've said it. But at the end of the day, you must do what's best for you and your goals and what you're trying to achieve. Because if you can't justify why you're doing a movement, you probably shouldn't be doing it. We are now going to do common question of the week. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a lighter one this week. It's a zombie apocalypse. You can only choose one hat from your collection to take on your survival journey. This may be a hat that protects you, helps to keep you hidden, or maybe even confuses zombies with its dazzling properties. Which hat are you choosing? I don't even need to think about it. Well, actually, that's like, I did need to think about it, but considering it's the second time I filmed this video, I already know what I'm gonna choose. I don't know where it is. I know it's somewhere, I'm not sure, but you'll remember it. You know the, the bunny hat with the, you, these are my ears, the flicky ears, they go boom, 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 boom. That's the one. Pitch this, zombie apocalypse, walking dead. I'm out there. Zombies come charging towards me. Head down, protecting. Flick, flick, flick in the face. It's like a backhand to the face. Zombie, slap, zombie, slap, laughing. They're like, oh wow, we can still get through that. Oh, that's what you think. I duck under the arm, dip to the side, hat off. Yeet, I'm a cowboy. Grab the zombie by the neck, pull him close towards me. Zombie's right there. I decide actually, you know what? We're not close, I don't want to cuddle. Maybe go away, zombie, please don't eat me. I then kick him away, still holding on to the ear things. As I kick away, I spin him. Do loads of 360, dizzy zombie, dizzy zombie, dizzy zombie. Tornado, tornado, tornado. His arms are flailing. He's knocking out all the other zombies as he goes. Completed it. So yeah, I would actually have to lean towards the bunny hat. If this was like solid and this was like rock hard, I'd probably choose this because it's like a horn. I feel like I'm in Robot Wars. Like headbutt, unicorn. But that is it. That is a video. 1100 likes in the first 24 hours is the goal. So if we could hit that, that'd be bloody splendid. If you haven't already, please do consider subscribing to the channel by clicking the red button down below and the bell next to it. So you get notified when I upload every week, twice a week. If you too have a question you want me to answer at the end of the next video, drop it down below for comment question of the week and I shall do so. Hopefully you tolerated me. Hopefully you tolerated half of the hat that you can see because ultimately if you want to see the full hat, I have to go all the way down here. And if I sit upright, you're not sick. It, it's huge. It's actually massive. Hi, my chair can't go any lower than this. I digress. Like I said, thank you for tolerating me. Thank you for tolerating my oversized hat and oversized head. And thank you for tolerating the video. I've got to stand up now. <laughs> Ew, I can't get up. <laughs> Agility.